Come and leave it there. I was down with the no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did for me. Praise God, praise God, praise God. This is Pastor Duncan and I'm here with my wife. First Lady Marcia Duncan. And I'm here with our praise team. Yay! And we are here with some exciting news. Just in case you have not heard, but we are reopened. Yeah. We've reopened both of our sites, Port Norris and Violin. My wife will tell you the times for each one of those services in case you can make it. In Vineland, get up early because our worship service begins at 9.30 to 10.30. And Port Norris is 11.30 to 12.30. I hope that all of you come out and join us live, in person, and in the church. And, and you need to know that our virtual worship is always going to be a part. So we know that we're still in the pandemic. And everybody's not going to come back, don't worry. Our virtual worship times are still the same. 10 o'clock, you can pick us up for an exciting service. We're calling these services an hour of power. Amen. And the reason Amen. we're making an hour of power, right now we don't know what this virus is going to do. We don't know where it's going. But we want you to know that we're open so you can come out yes. if you're in the area and visit us and get a live service with us. Also, we want to take time, me and my wife, to thank you. These lovely men and women here, Thank men and women in our praise team, many of you have been blessed. They have come out for over a year, not complaining, fighting through COVID. You want to talk about frontline folks? And each week. And each week. These are frontline people. Two or three times we come out rehearsing and singing, and I am so blessed as a pastor. We're blessed as a church. Pastor, you know what? Mm -hmm. We forgot about our musicians and our tech people. Oh, that's right. They come out every week, too. Uh, musicians. The hours are long. Okay, but the musicians are gone. All we have is our, our assistant minister of music. Come on up here so we can uh, bring you in. Oh, Dion. Yeah. Hi, Dion. Yeah. Yeah. So this is our assistant, uh, Minister of Music, one of our co-minister of music here, Shiloh. He's also leading our band. It's been an exciting, we've had fun, right guys? Yeah. 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 We've had frustration, we've had fun, we've had all of it. And I wish I could bring the tech people up, but they're actually, oh, well, you know they're what? actually filming this. You know what? what? Sean, can you come up? Can you come up, Sean? Sure thing. <laughs> all right. All right. This, this is our lead cameraman. And, and I am second in command. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our lead camera guy, and we're so excited about him. Uh, John Cross, do you want to come up? Oh, yeah. Where's John? He's just waiting. He's waiting for the <laughs> So anyhow, we want you to know that we, we are open, and please pray for us. Yes. And you don't have to worry. We have followed. We've overdone our precautions, and we, you can be safe when you come to Shiloh. We just want to say this to all of you. Come on out with us, and we're going to give you a big welcome right now. One, two, three. Welcome back! Praise God. We thank all of you. God bless you. Come on.
they'll take care of you. Can I get a witness? Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous.
no matter how bad they torture him. We think that's, that's a hero. That's what you're supposed to do. And then he throws in a few of those quips, you know, like, uh, when is the fun going to start after they just got done waterboarding him? Or he talks about, my mother is harder than that. Or if you're a woman uh, and you're watching Cinderella, you never identify with the evil stepmother or the evil stepsister. No, you always are Cinderella, the one who is treated wrongly, done wrongly, but then is vindicated in the end of the story by putting you on that glass slipper and riding off with the prince. We always identify with the hero, and especially when we read our Bible. You know, we are always the one who is standing up for faith. If we read the story of David and Goliath, who are we? We are not those cowardly brothers of David. We are not those soldiers or even cowardly King Saul. We identify with David. We say, my faith is strong enough to do what David did. And so we identify when David, when Goliath comes out and makes that bold challenge to any man that will come and insults God. We feel like David felt when David looked at him in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, and said, look, you come to me with a spear and a sword and a shield, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have insulted and defied this day. David was strong. He was not scared. And that's who we identify with. Well, think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. And they heated the fiery furnace hotter than it's ever been heated. And all of a sudden, we're watching them as the king says, bow or burn. And we look at them as they look at the king, very honest and not being said, oh, king. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, 18. It says, we're not going to obey to you. Said, if it be so, the God that we serve will is able to deliver us from you and will deliver us from you. But if he does not, be it known, O king, we will not serve your gods or bow down to your golden image. Man, they were some bad Somebody, the king was upset, but they stood their ground. Or all of us got indignant when we heard what Joe's wife said. Think about it. I'm not the only one. What was wrong with Joe's wife when she sat up there talking about in Joe chapter 2? Said, uh, Joe, you're going to keep your integrity? You're going to keep your faith in God? Why don't you curse your God and die? We were saying, curse God and die. What's wrong with her? Just because they just lost their children, their house, their wealth, their cattle, their servants, and now Job is sitting up there with sores all over his body. What's wrong with her? She's going to give up because of that? And then we would answer her the same way Job did in Job chapter 2, verse 10. Verse Job, said. Job said, woman, you sound like a foolish woman. What? Am I only exposed to say good from God? And not except the evil, he said, and Job never cursed God with his lips. You better hear that. Don't miss that part. That is what this message is about today. That we need to understand that Job never cursed God with his lips. You know what? We are some powerful Christians you know, because we identify with Job. Uh, we identify with being that hero. But I have a question for you. This is a simple question. Would, would you really? Is that what you really do? Now think about it. I, don't, don't just fantasize it. Somebody said, would you really walk up to a giant with just a slingshot and your faith confession? Come on, tell the truth. Would you really Stand in front of a fiery furnace, heated hotter than it's ever been heated, and sit there knowing all I got to bow down one time, and I can escape. Would I really walk into that fire? And would you really, 
after losing your family, your money, your wealth, the daddy sitting there saying, would you be out there going, hey, God, would you really do that? Here is what we need to understand. We say some powerful things. Uh, but a lot of times, we say things, but we don't mean what we say. I want to bring to your attention that it's easy to try to identify with a hero, but would you really do that? Because we say stuff, if I can bring you back to reality, we say stuff like, can nobody do me like Jesus? But when we really go through trials, you know what we do? Sometimes God is the last one we call on. We go to everybody else but God. Or we stand up there when the anointing hit us and say, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and peed every roll. Come on, you know. And we stand there, but as soon as the pressure's on and the heat's on, it's like, why God? Where are you? Why did this happen to me? It's like our love fades away. Or we tell God, where you lead me, I will follow. Uh, and we want to pick up our cross and follow God. Uh, that is until you get a new job or a new boyfriend or a girlfriend or get some economic freedom. Then God can't find you. Your cross is the last thing you want to find. As a matter of fact, you say stuff like, I sure was tax to stop calling it. Mm -hmm. I got somebody. Don't you know I'm working? But a minute ago, you said you would follow God. That's what this message is about. Watch this. The reality of how God's word is set up, how God's expectations are based on what we say and what we do, how we speak and how we act. You need to know that what we say, God wants us to be true to the words we say. What I really got from my faith, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer did. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, just very quickly, he was hanged for his faith on April 9, 1945, in a German prison because he refused to stop preaching the truth about God once Hitler and the Third Reich took over Germany and took over the churches and was telling them what they could preach. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, no, I'd rather die than not preach my faith. And you know what? He was imprisoned on April 8th and on April 9th, 1945 at the Flossenburg prison. Concentration camp. He was led and hanged by the neck. So you know, I was reporter on what he did. I was report said that he prayed, took some steps, he prayed. Now somebody said, you know, the theologians say we don't know if he did all that, but what we do know is he willingly died on the cross. He willingly died by hanging because Jesus died on the cross. Bonhoeffer left us. One of his greatest works is called The Cost of Discipleship. In this book, The Cost of Discipleship, he is the one who coined the phrase cheap grace. Cheap grace. He said cheap grace is grace is it's, uh, it's baptism uh, without uh, sanctification and holy living. It is preaching forgiveness with no requiring of repentance. It is communion with no confession. It is a cross with no Christ. It is grace with no discipline. It is asking God for everything and not living for God. She, grace, let me hurry, let me hurry in there. This message is going to show you the real cost of our discipleship on this promise The real principles that this message is going to teach. Here's what this word says. That everything in the Bible is set up by say what you mean, mean what you say, and live it. Don't, don't lose that. Say what you mean. Everything in the Bible is set up by our confession. Our confession leads us to a truth. The truth we speak out. And then we live the truth, we speak, and we get blessed. Watch the man about. 
our confession leads us to a truth. We speak that truth, then we live it, and we get blessed by what we say. The whole principle of God, the principle of Scripture, is based on this formula. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and live it. Many people have lost their blessings because you say stuff and you don't even plan on defending it. You don't live it, but you need to do that. Everything in the Bible is set up on us saying what we mean, Meaning what we say, and then what am I talking about? Romans, our salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. This is the verse. Even our salvation is based on saying, meaning, and living. Look what he said. If thou will confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, he said, Thou shalt be saved. But with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. I feel my heart coming right now. Listen to me. Maybe you don't get a blessing because you're not speaking blessings. Proverbs 18 and 21 says, Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You need to understand, life and death are in the power of our tongue. Many of us don't realize God has set this thing up so we can speak our way through. What are you speaking this morning? What are you saying today? What mood are you in? What attitude do you have? Have you spoke life over your life? Or have you just sat there? Death, life, in the power of our tongue. The principle is if we speak it, we can control our Destiny. Oh, I'm talking to somebody about this. Even Jesus Christ himself in John 14, 10, lived by this principle. In the Gospel of John, when he came to him, he said, The words that I speak, they are not my words. They are my Father's who dwells in me. And once my Father speaks the word, he does the work. Once I live by the word, Jesus said, that's in me from my Father, I get a blessing. Have you heard yet? Once you understand the word that is in you, that you put in you, the anointed word, you can change any circumstance. And then James brings it home in James 1.22 when he says, watch this, be ye not just, be doers of the word and not just hearers. Oh, this is a powerful principle. Say it, mean it, Live it. You cannot demonize it. Out of your life. Say it, mean it, live it. You can change your circumstances. Now, I know you say, well, Pastor, that's good. But what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? I'm glad you asked because I was looking at this text, which is a traditional text of Palm Sunday, and I said, Lord, I've preached this a thousand times. What do you want me to say? And all of a sudden, I got a revelation from God that came forth where the Lord said, I want you to see something. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy by riding into Jerusalem while palm branches were being strewn around. He fulfilled the prophecy in Zechariah 9. He fulfilled the prophecy of being the Messiah. He left nothing out. But I want you to look close at that text. Those who left me already, he will miss the best part of the sermon. Because in that text, there was something. It says there was a multitude, verse 2, oh, sorry, verse 1 and 2, that spread palm branches and their clothes all over the road. And they were hollering, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were calling him Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he. Who comes in the name of the Lord? But the problem is, they said it, didn't mean it. How do I know? Because they didn't live it. We talked about that. I checked through the scriptures, and we found out where were these shouters of Hosanna when Jesus was being crucified? Where was he when Jesus was hanging on the cross? Where was he when he needed faithful believers to hold on as he, the stone was rolled away and he was resurrected? Check the scripture. Where were they? They had abandoned Jesus. Everyone ran away. And God gave me the principle, you can be praising God, shouting to God, calling Hosanna, and not really know him. And because you don't mean what you say, you miss all the blessings in your life. These folks. Walked away from 
Jesus. There's a tragedy there that I want to explore. I want to explore the hypocrisy of you calling out God for blessings, but you never live in what you already know. I want to explore the disconnect between your confession and the life you live. You want to talk about how power suddenly works? Quit throwing your clothes and giving your heart. Quit throwing branches and all this other stuff and give God your time. We're going to look at three points so this never happens to you. And I'll be done. Take you through this. The first thing we're going to look at is the tragedy of empty praise. Then we're going to look at the tragedy of unrecognized miracles. And then we're going to look at finally the tragedy of saying it. Missing the power of the word and not believing it. Man, right here, Holy oh, Spirit is telling me God is banging somebody's door down saying, if you would just believe that I could deliver you. But you just say stuff and you don't believe it. Let's look, what's going on in this text? Jesus is going to Jerusalem. You know that he's about to be arrested and um, that he's going to be judged and taken from hall to hall and crucified. But he went anyhow. He has made up his mind in his human form that he was going to do whatever he had to do to fulfill his calling from God. Oh, that's a word right there. Our Savior modeled something that we need to model. He decided that no matter how rough my circumstances look, I know I gotta go to Cameron. I know I gotta go through some pain. I know I gotta go through some struggle. Can I stop there and tell somebody, expect the pain, but also expect victory? Because Jesus said, I'm going. He rode into Jerusalem triumphantly, even though he knew he was riding in the trouble. All I'm saying to you is keep on riding. No matter what you go through, Jesus had an expectation that when God got done, it was going to be better. Those of us who've been through struggle, been through trials, we can tell you right now that the biggest blessing in our life is when we have those trials in our pocket and we're able to say, I know God is able. What are you talking about? I'm telling you right now that uh, Warren Words gave a great illustration uh, years ago. I, I, I remember it. It was so powerful. This young boy was trying to... Uh, Talk his sister in walking up this mountain path with him. Uh, so he told her, oh, come on with me. There's a, there's a nice path that we can follow. He convinced her. And as they were walking up the hill, there was rocks and dirt was falling and it almost slipped. And the young girl looked at him and said, hey, this is no path. There's bumps everywhere. And the young boy looked at her and said, the boats are what you climb on. Did you get it? What a great philosophy. Every ill moment, every late night struggle, every day you stood hurting, every time you came through a challenge, every time you made it through another hour of pain, that was a boat in the road that you climbed on to go to a higher level of trust in God. What a great philosophy. All I'm telling somebody is quit complaining. Jesus has showed us the bumps are what you climb on. Think back, think back. I don't have time. Every one of those things they thought was going to hurt you, the devil thought was going to kill you, it was the thing that made you stronger. Jesus told his disciples to go find a donkey, uh, tell them that the Lord has need. I don't have time to preach this, but God always gives provision for the vision. Jesus knew God would have it waiting on him. He told them to, you know, to bring the donkey in. And I'm going to be, I'm going to ride in so I can fulfill the scripture. And then when Jesus was riding in, they started throwing uh, palm branches. And they started throwing things about him. But this is how we know they didn't mean it. Watch the text. First of all, they threw palm branches. They cut down branches. Palm branches cut down as someone's riding in means it's a ride of triumph, victory, and loyalty. They were saying, I'm loyal to you, God. 
Then they spread their clothes down so that he could ride through. That was a sign of dedication on him. When they spread their clothes down and they started crying, Hosanna, the word Hosanna means save now. And you would think they understood that they were asking God to do that because they had a knowledge of who God was. And then finally, they gave him the title, Son of David, which was a messianic term. So they spread their garments and they pledged their loyalty. They called us that we can say it now. And then they also said, we know you are the Messiah. And then they did not live it. They left it. They quit. That's what I call empty praise. Oh, some of you sitting there crying, whining, and complaining. It's because your praise was really empty. It was empty praise. You praise because, I always say, first of all, you praise because everybody else is doing it. You know, you get in church, it's expected that you praise, right? So you praise because everybody else is praising God. Or you praise because some, some church leader stands up and says, everybody praise the Lord. And when we praise, our, our mind sometimes doesn't even connect with our heart. We just sing praise, not knowing that we have a God who we can actually lift up with our praise. Even in your kitchen, in your house by yourself, every time you lift up a praise, you should be cognizant of who it is you're praising. But the third way is going to be praise because it was just autopilot. Sometimes we just say praise God like we say everything else. Empty praise can't bless God because empty praise does not know God's works. That's the first thing I want to tell you. The reason you can't mean what you say and say what you mean and live is because you don't know God's worth. If you knew God was worthy, then you could do that. But you got to get to a point where you understand. Some people like us, we just glad God lets us praise Him. With all the stuff we've done, I mean, maybe you're better off, but I know some days I'm just surprised, shocked, and honored that God lets me in His presence to praise Him. Anybody with me? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I know me. And God does. Think about the prodigal son. Right? We've heard the story many times. Think about the prodigal son. Um, he had left his dad's place angrily, had all the party he wanted, had all the sex he wanted, had all the drugs he wanted, had all the money he wanted, and he tried everything, but when it ran out, he found himself living in a big pen. So he had everything he wanted, but when he was down, where the bottom is when he couldn't find his way up. You know the first place he thought about? Home. Why think about home now? Because back in his mind, he knew that home. There was somebody there that loved him. See, even though you're running from God, you know, deep in your mind, when everything else runs out, that's when you go back to God. Because you know, no matter what's happening, he's there. But here's the good thing. He didn't go back arrogant. He didn't go back prideful. He didn't go back in there, you know, uh, angrily demanding stuff. Look at what he said. Maybe he'll make me like one of his hired servants. But he knew his dad would turn him. What I want you to see is he knew there was a love there. And he knew that uh, when he went back to his father, he was ready to go back in a surrender state. Those of us who praise God and know why we praise him, we praise him because we've had those times when we tried everything else. When the bottom fell out, when you know, when the rubber in the road, when we got our, it was always God that picked us up. Oh, so when I praise him, my praise is real. My praise comes from my heart. I praise him because I can't live without my God. Real praisers understand there's also power in our praise. I, I have been to a place, you ever been there where praise is all I had? Uh, I had to trust in my praise. But since I knew the word, the word said that you can pray so hard that walls of Jericho will fall down. I saw God knock walls out of my way as I rode off praising him when I needed bills paid, praising him when I needed healing, and praising him when I needed deliverance. And all of a sudden, you know, we look at the Bible, there's some uh, jailhouse rock praise where Paul and Silas at midnight, they, I love that, at midnight, I love that, I said at midnight, the darkest hour, they began to praise God. So real praisers understand. Then Jesus went to the temple, right? He got the money changed. We want to see that. But there's one more point about praise. When you go down to that 15th verse, look what it said. 
and the chief priests and the scribes saw, and all the children were saying how wonderful God was, and they got indignant. Follow this. They began to praise God. And then Jesus answered them out of the mouth of babes, out of the text, and something thou hast ordained praise. Look what he was saying. He looked at them and said, Haven't you heard? What Jesus was telling them is, and I like this because sometimes the reason many of us fail is because we don't have enough word in us. This was the first thing. The origin of that scripture is Psalms 8 and 2. You know that at the text, you know that Psalms 8 and 2 is where uh, Jesus said, uh, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. And that text meant that even babes, the word suckling, those who haven't been weaned yet, have they not been weaned, can look up and see the power of God and know. That he is worthy of praise. Real praisers understand that. Not only that, but the tragedy of unrecognized miracles. Look what happened. They left. Jesus came back. He cursed the fig tree. I got to move. I cursed it with me. He cursed the fig tree. And when he cursed the fig tree, the Bible said that the disciples looked at how fast it withered. And then the text said they were surprised. They were surprised. His disciples marveled that the big tree was withered. Uh, I know this can't be right. I mean, that lets you know they didn't mean what they said. It's only me. Because at this late date in Jesus' ministry, you know how many miracles they saw of God did? What they should have said, or what they should have known is, by this time, whatever God says, he does. They should have been expecting the tree to wither. As many of us, one of the problems is, we do not take our prior confessions of God into our new trouble. Oh, that's good. I'll say it again. You could, you would wait, you would take a whole lot of time out of your misery if you remember what God has already done and take your prior confession. Because you know, when they saw Jesus feed the 5,000, they saw him open the eyes of blind Barnabas. They saw Jesus turn water to wine. They saw Jesus raise Jairus' daughter. They saw him take the demonic up into the air and get the demon out of him. They, they probably went around talking about how bad Jesus was and, oh, look what he did. But you know what? They didn't recognize or they didn't remember that confession. And every time we disconnect what we say because we didn't really mean it, hello, then we don't live it. We fall into another trap. There was an addict, a addict person who got saved and became a believer. And his buddy said, man, you don't really believe all that miracle stuff in the Bible about Jesus does miracles. He said, yeah. I believe it. Because I've seen Jesus do a miracle. He took crack cocaine and turned it into a living room set. He took crack cocaine and turned it into bedroom sets for all my kids. He took my crack cocaine and got us a new car. All he was saying is, I believe it because I know I've already felt the miracles and seen the miracles of God. You gotta understand that if you don't understand or you don't remember telling somebody how good God was, and you don't bring that into the pain you're suffering now, the devil's going to win. Say it, mean it, live it. Let's go to the last point. But before we find out, you should understand something about understanding unrecognized miracles. Your problem is you're looking for a tree to fall. You're looking for something big to happen. When you don't realize that, if you don't recognize the little thing, like you're still here, <laughs> like what God already did, you'll never be excited about the big things. What am I talking about? Joni Erickson Todd, you know her, she's a lady who is a paraplegic, who has led a whole lot of people to Christ, love the Lord. She tells a story about laying in bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. She said, my husband Ken was laying next to me. He was sleeping, snoring softly. She said, but... At that moment, he didn't know I was biting my lip not to wake him up. She said, usually my paralysis and my late night insomnia leads me to be claustrophobic, but this was different. I had searing pain in my neck. I turned my head on the pillow, and I couldn't, and I, I would have tried to get some comfort, but all of a sudden there was a sharp pain that shot even further. I didn't know if I was going to live. And I said, I can't wake up my husband. His alarm's going to go off. He's got to go to work. She said, she said, Lord, you got to help me. I can't live like this. I need to be repositioned. What do I do?
do? She said at that moment, she began to take deep breaths. And she started singing her favorite hymn. Oh, to see him face to face and tell the story of his amazing grace. To see him face to face and tell the story of his amazing grace. To see him face to face and tell the story. And she said, next thing she knew, it was morning. Kay went off to work. Her friend came over to get her out of bed. And she told her friend about what was bad last night. And her friend said, I know you can't wait to get to heaven. And Joni shocked her. She said, no, I got a little bit of heaven right here on earth. Last night, I saw God do a miracle. Can I tell you, as you're believing for a big miracle, don't miss the ones that you already had. Recognize and trust those miracles. Let's go to the last point. The last point of this text. The tragedy of saying it and not meaning it. So this is the last verse. Verse 21. Jesus, when the disciples were fascinated by this, Jesus actually answered them and said, If you believe, you know, all of a sudden you can say, You not only will do what I did to the fig tree, but you can say to the mountain, We got removed, we got cast into. Here's what Jesus said. The biggest tragedy in this text is that these disciples found themselves saying all kinds of profession, had empty praises, didn't recognize the miracles that God had already done, and they found themselves not able to live through the present situation. What am I saying? I'm telling you that many people have walked away from God. The scripture tells us about Alexander and Hymenaeus, how they walked away from God. The text says they made shipwreck their faith because they got to the place and they were turned over to Satan. Uh, a shipwreck about your faith means this. It means that uh, you whine and complain so much so you might not even be saved because you said stuff but you didn't mean and you never lived it. So you don't know what's real. How can you turn to a leader on the same you can't? But you can turn somebody over who never really grasped it. Children of Israel. Ananias and Sapphire. Here's what I'm telling you to close this up. Respect God's word. Respect the God who been keeping you and loving you and blessing you. Trust him. Respect yourself. When I was growing up as a child, it was a song in the 70s by a single singer that said, Respect yourself. And if you can't respect yourself, ain't nobody gonna give a good kahoot. Nah, 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 nah. What does it say? If you don't respect the you that God has made, the fact that you let you understand me, then you're never ever going to tap into the blessing. Because our lives are lived by this formula. Say what we mean, mean what we say. Live it. Our confession leads us to truth, and truth leads us to something we speak. We live it, and we are blessed. This past Doug can say, on this time, suddenly stay blessed and learn to love the you that God made. And if you say it, mean it, then live it. God bless you. Talk it to him and leave it there. I was down. But with no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free What he did.